Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to your fave film critic, the movie critic person podcast, starring, hosted by, produced by me, Dom Griffin, your favorite film critic, I would hope. Uh, this is episode four of season two of the podcast. <clears throat> we are, for the third week in a row, we're going faceless again, for those of us, uh, those of you watching this on the YouTube uh, at this point, I'm not even going to keep explaining why. I'm just like, you'll see my face again when it's like ready. <laughs> We're going to pretend that like my, um, uh, that like I have a bunch of bandages on my head, like Milo in the counterfeit detective arc of hundred bullets. And, um, I'm just unrecognizable right now. So whenever I take the bandages off in the final act, I'll be my new face and it, I look like Clive Owen now or whatever. It'll, uh. That's, I don't know why, I'm, why am I going with this bit? Anyway, welcome back to the pod. Uh, we have lots of fun stuff to talk about today. I only watched one movie this week, so uh, a bulk of the episode is going to be about that one movie, and if you are listening to this, you've already seen uh, the thumbnail or album art, so you know what movie that is, and we'll get into that movie later. Uh, I have a handful of like news things to talk about. And then, um, there's one other thing. I mean, the other, only other thing I really watched this week other than that one movie, which is going to dominate most of the episode, uh, is I watch more wrestling and I do have some more wrestling thoughts to share, but it, it's not going to like cannibalize the pod like it did last week. Uh, I, I guess I think maybe if you're going to be listening to the pod for the next like few months, just <clears throat> it's WrestleMania season. It's just going to, it's just going to seep in. There's nothing I can do about it at this point. I apologize. Uh, by summer, I'll probably be burnt out again on wrestling and uh, I, I won't watch quite as, quite as, uh, ardently, but still, uh, yeah, I hope you guys are having like a good week and stuff. We're, um, uh, midway through black history month. Uh, I think I saw a thing, some very corny meme about how biracial people can only celebrate half of the month. So it's like your free trial runs up the day after Valentine's Day. But uh, I'm going to celebrate the whole fucking month. I don't care. Can't stop me. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's just get into it, man. We're going to start off talking about some stuff in the news. Uh, the first thing, I feel like maybe the headlining uh, topic of the week in terms of things that have, you know, I don't want to say broke the internet because that's just not true. Actually, no, you know, before we talk about the other thing, sorry, I just realized we're going to talk about breaking the internet. Um, we're going to talk about music for a second. Uh, so uh, at the Super Bowl, Beyonce had a Verizon commercial um, uh, with like Tony Hale is in the commercial. Uh, Tony Hale from Veep and Arrested Development and other stuff, uh, presumably. And the, the, you know, the whole thing about how Beyonce like broke the internet in 2013 when she surprise released her, her self-titled album and all the videos for it at once. It was like a big, you know, big deal, big, big game changer. So the concept of the commercial is like, she's going to break Verizon's, you know, powerful 5g network. And no matter what big stunts she does, she can't. So it's like, she is like opens a lemonade stand and recreates stuff from the holdup video. She runs for president. I think maybe that happens. She does a handful of like, things where I was like, okay, I get it. You guys are, you know, talking about her, her stature as a, as a gigantic artist, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the whole gag of it is just like, oh, well, you know, that's how powerful Verizon's network is. Even Beyonce can't uh, break it or whatever the hell. Uh, and then at the end of the commercial, she was like, well, I only one left thing left to do. Like, let's release that new music. And then she dropped, uh, two new singles. Uh, one's called 16 Carriages. I don't remember what the other one's called, actually. I just remember 16 Carriages because it's like the catchier of the two, I suppose. Uh, 16 Carriages and Texas Hold'em. So these are the two lead singles for Renaissance Part 2, the second part of the Renaissance trilogy. And if Renaissance was largely like house and like 90s dance music and stuff, it seems like this is going to be a country-inflected album. And I remember that was like a rumor, even when the first Renaissance, first part of Renaissance came out. And I was like, you know, 
Beyonce releases an entire album that's just the song Daddy Lessons from Lemonade. That sounds like a, it'd be rad. I'd be super into that, actually. Um, I'm not one of those any genre but country people. Uh, like, I, I, I like country music, too. I'm not as knowledgeable about it as I am most musical genres, but, like, I'm not against shit with, like, guitars and twang and whatnot. Uh, I mean, I guess technically you, I could say, like, I kind of prefer, like, older throwback country and stuff. Like, when, like, Walk, Walk the Line came out, the Johnny Cash movie, I was like, I guess most of this stuff is technically country music and it's all pretty killer, so maybe that's what I'm into. But at the same time, like, I listen to lots of, like, corny Walmart country shit to you here and there. Like, whatever, I'm... I'm equal opportunity, but, uh, there's like this, look, it's a big deal. Beyonce was releasing a new single, new singles. The album's coming, I think next month. Um, she looked really cool with the blonde platinum wig and the cowboy iconography stuff, like lots of fun memes about it. Like a yeah, great job. Good job B. But like, I, I've already seen people leaning into this sort of like preemptive narrative about, well, Beyonce's putting out a country album. Is CMT going to play the videos? Like, is she going to be on country radio? And within the first week, there's already been stories of like people requesting the song at country radio stations and country radio stations not wanting to play it. And it's like, see, it's that racism. It's, you know, da, 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 da. And like, there is a weird thing that happens in the music industry. Like, this isn't made up. There's this thing where essentially if you're a black artist and you do some new weird genre stuff whatever genre thing you do does not matter like you're still gonna end up in like the r&b and hip-hop and like rap whatever categories uh doesn't matter if your whole album is like no no the whole thing is like not this it'll be like yeah but you're black so it is so deal with it and yeah i i i saw people being preemptively again mad that like oh she gets nominated for grammys and she's not in the country categories and that's not fair da, da, da. and it was just like well i mean okay that's album's not even fucking out yet you guys are already like pre-writing think pieces and i just i remember thinking the cool thing or the interesting thing here is like beyonce is an artist who like whatever she does she like really really like throws herself into it so it's going to be interesting to see what that's like largely in this other space. Like, I wonder what that's going to sound like for the length of an album. I wonder how many different places she's going to go, who her collaborator is going to be. I'm pretty sure all the like stands already know this stuff. Like it's been a very long time since I've been deep enough into an artist to like, you know, follow a whole album rollout and know all the, all the cryptic pictures from the studio and what all the people in the message boards are saying about, you know, I'm, I'm not into anything music wise that way anymore. So I don't, I mean, maybe everyone already knows who's going to be on it and I just don't, maybe I'm just, I'm, I'm late to the party, but uh, uh, the idea is to me like there's, that's a, that's a fascinating thing. That's like, this is going to be like different than her other albums or this, what it's going to be like, what it's going to sound like the idea that someone is like a fan of hers. And the first thing they jump to is like a victim narrative already. It's sort of like, well, it's going to be great. And people are not going to respect her for it. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's like two songs out. People seem to really like them. I, I, I'm not saying that that's, those things can't happen or that they won't happen, but it felt really weird to me to take like this, what could be like a pretty cool, like celebratory moment, like a little victory lap of her coming back for part two of this trilogy. And like, she's doing something totally different and to just focus on like, and I'm sure they're going to do this and this is going to happen. And I was like, that just sounds fucking miserable. <laughs> That sounds like a really miserable way to have to like engage with your favorite artist's music. And like, I'm sure a lot of stands, I guess are probably like that. I feel like a lot of people like to, I don't know Nicki Minaj fans for certain are kind of like that. They love the, to lead with like, well, she's being silenced and there's so many people who don't want her to succeed. And it's just like, I, I've never, I don't want to say I've never understood, but I do not understand th this thing where like how often like big gigantic winners people who are like grotesquely rich hugely famous could not be categorized more as winners still need to be underdogs you know like nikki's whole brand is like that like she's the biggest rapper of all time however also she's really unsung and underrated and people don't respect her enough and you're like okay weird <laughs> you know and like i mean like taylor swift some of her fans kind of have a similar vibe where it's like she's huge one of the biggest stars ever but also people just don't you know, they don't, they, 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 they still don't get it. They don't really, really respect her. And you're like, okay. I mean, I guess 
obviously the, the 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 common denominator here is these are like women in the music industry and obviously there are things that are going to happen to women uh, that are going to be very different than like to male artists like for sure a thousand percent but at the same time it's just like is there any way that you can just put out music and not have to frame yourself as being like an underdog like if you're a billionaire i just don't I fundamentally cannot look at you as an underdog. Like I cannot look at any, any of your plight, no matter how logical your frustrations are and feel anything for it. Like I cannot, I don't, I'm just like, I don't feel that I'm not like if (laughs) Beyonce puts out this country album and sells a lot of records, wins a lot of awards, but still doesn't win the best award or doesn't win the biggest award or whatever. It's going to be millions and millions of dollars on the tour, all these, all these things. If at the end of all of that, people are like, it's still not enough. And I'm just like, I don't, that just to me seems like a horrible way to enjoy something. And it was like kind of a bummer, I guess. Cause like I worked during the Super Bowl, So like, I didn't, I didn't like really pay attention to any of the Super Bowl stuff happening. So like I got home and even then like, I'd like turn around and get up the next morning. So like I, I, all the Super Bowl things trickled down to me throughout the next day or two. So I wasn't even around <laughs> online for like the uh, initial run of holy shit beyonce got a country song out that's crazy we gotta go get our glitter cowboy boots and be prepared for whatever and i was like okay it ran directly into and you just know what's gonna happen now and i was like oh man you guys didn't even fucking wait a week you know what i mean like we're not even the album is not even out yet it's not even like okay the album's out the embargo is up and there's a bunch of reviews and the reviews have created the narrative that we're frustrated about like that would make sense to me the shit's not even out yet. We don't even know what it's going to be. Like, for, it's it's highly unlikely that it'll be bad, but it is also conceivable that this could be like a, a, a huge mistake. <laughs> like, I don't think we live in the world where Beyonce's country album is the Beyonce version of Lil Wayne's Rebirth. Like, I don't know that this will be the, the, the Beyonce equivalent of Lil Wayne uh hanging out with Kevin Rudolph and holding a guitar and stuff for, for no real reason. Like, I don't think it'll be that, but it could, this could end up being really embarrassing and weird and, and, and not, not a vibe, but you know, to preemptively just decide, well, it's obviously going to be the greatest country thing to ever exist. And they're not going to respect it. And her and the Dixie chicks are going to have to do, it was just like people just launched into this like post-apocalyptic fantasy of like all these, these gatekeepers and all this different stuff. And it was just like, I, personally have a hard time believing that that's Beyonce's main goal with this. I think maybe she's just from Texas and she just wanted to show that she can do this too. Or maybe this is where her, her muse took her. That's cool. <laughs> you know, for people to be like, no, it's it. She has to show them this and this. And it's just like, man, I, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to believe that, that everything, all of her creative inspirations are just like, sort of like pettiness and, and all this different stuff. Like I understand, uh, you know, I, I sort of understand that the, the idea of, of needing to kind of like be exacting about your craft and to, and to like kind of prove people wrong and to kind of be very thorough in the way you establish your greatness. Like I, I, you know, I, I know Virgo women too, but I still just think that like, it's such a bummer that these songs are out and like, I haven't even had time to like learn the lyrics or like have them stuck in my head because every time I see anything about one of the songs, it's always accompanied by like a screed, like a, pre- a, a prepared screed about how, you know, they're not cutting off enough Luke Bryan songs to make space for the new Beyonce at the country record station. I never fucking listened to anyway, you know? And I was just like, man, I can't, Radio is already so bad in general that like, I don't know that I want to pick a fight about a new specific way that radio is being bad. Like I don't listen to radio. So like, what does it matter? But I don't know. That was sorry that the, I was talking about this other news item breaking the internet and that popped into my head and I just, but, uh, you know, I hope it's good. I hope it's a good album. Like I thought Renaissance was pretty good. Like, uh, not my favorite. Now I don't know if it was like one of my, I don't even know it's like, I don't even know it's like my favorite, like top five Beyonce albums, honestly. I don't know, but, um, but I hope this one's good too. Like shit. I hope the third one's like, I hope she does like rock music on that one or like hyper pop. I don't fucking know. It's Beyonce. I'll listen to whatever it is. I'll check it out. But I wish people would just be cool. (laughs) I really, I think we need to bring back just being cool about the things that you like. Just be regular. (laughs) If you like something, just like it. You don't have to like go to fucking war with everybody over it. It's okay. 
Uh, but speaking about breaking the internet on Valentine's Day, so yesterday, I don't know what day it is right now. Uh, Marvel finally announced the official casting for the Fantastic Four, which is coming out, I think, a couple of weeks before Superman Legacy now. And it's called the Fantastic Four, no, no longer Fantastic Four. And they released this like cute, cool art thing. It's like an announcement, but it looks kind of like a greeting card. And it shows that Pedro Pascal is officially Reed Richards and that Vanessa Kirby is officially uh, the Invisible Woman, Sue Storm. And then that uh, Yvonne from The Bear, the guy who's Richie, uh, is playing Ben Grimm in The Thing. And then, then uh, Joseph Quinn, who played Eddie Munson on Stranger Things, is Johnny Storm. And then also it shows Herbie, like the little fucking robot, is in the ad, which I thought was kind of cute. And like the font and everything and the logo and stuff, it's very throwback. And then like the thing is holding, I think, an issue of Time magazine that would date the image to the early 60s. I think to 1963, the year the Fantastic Four number one was published. Uh, so it seems like the movie is going to be at least partially a uh, period piece, which I think that's kind of cool. Uh, years ago, Peyton Reed, director of all the Ant-Man movies, at the time, he was mainly known for Bring It On and uh, Down With Love, had wanted to do a Fantastic Four movie and wanted to do it as a period piece and had like a whole whole thing planned for it that just never happened. I do think it's funny that he's made three movies for Marvel <laughs> And didn't get to do this one. Like, he, he probably still wanted it. And they were just like, no, sorry. Because um, it was supposed to be John Watts. It was supposed to be the Spider-Man guy. Um, but they replaced him with Matt Shankman. Shankman? The fella who directed uh, either all of or a lot of WandaVision. So, given WandaVision and, like, its attention to detail for recreating old television stuff. I was like, oh, okay, well, if he's doing it and that's the vibe, that could be cool. It could be cool. It's a, I mean, the MCU is not on, a, on the opposite of whatever hot streak is right now, but I'm okay with this cast. I, I think it could be good. I, I think this announcement and like the fact that it had a little bit of character to it and wasn't just another ugly fucking, all their posters and lot logos and everything just looked like dog shit to me. The fact that it has a little bit of flavor, that alone, I was like, hey, <laughs> you know what? You can't fault him for this. This is nice. <laughs> I don't know if the movie's going to turn out to be good. I don't know anything beyond this. I, you know, I don't. I think they have to start filming soon. It's supposed to be out in a, a year. Uh, but this was pleasant, I will say. You know, I was like, you know what? This is a pleasant thing. I support it. I hope it's good. I have no idea who's going to play Doctor Doom. I see people arguing online about this because it's like it's a natural thing. Okay, I wonder who they're going to cast as Marvel's like biggest, coolest villain ever. It's a big deal. And people are like, they shouldn't do Doctor Doom yet. It shouldn't be Doctor Doom. It should be the Mole Man or one of the one of the variants of Kang. And I was like, okay, sure. That's fine. Um, but also, like, who gives a shit? Just fucking do Doctor Doom. I don't... Like, Fantastic Four has a lot of cool villains and a lot of interesting side characters and stuff. But, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with having Doctor Doom be in it. Because if he's not in this movie, right, when are we going to meet him? And what other, what other thing is he going to show up in? A Fantastic Four sequel that's not going to come out until like 2045? You know what I mean? Like, fuck it. Put him in the movie. Come on. Grow up. I don't have any like I specific ideas for who should play the part. I think it... I mean, I guess technically it would have to be an actor who was like a peer of Pedro Pascal's. So that narrows it down a little bit. Um, like, I, I've always kind of felt like this would be like a good role for Mads Mikkelsen. I don't care that he's already elsewhere in the MCU. Uh... I know most people, you know, really feel like it's very important that the character be R R Romani, you know, because of like Doom's heritage and stuff. And like, I think that's probably pretty important, but I'm also someone who like, I don't get as up in arms about a lot of casting stuff related to representation because, you know, sometimes they'll do that and it'll be like the right thing to do and still not be good. So I don't really care one way or the other. Like my thing is like, I just hope it's good. I hope it's like a watchable movie. Uh, so I don't know what they're going to do. I don't, I don't know, but I, I feel like you have to introduce Doom at this point. Like, especially if there, if there's a strong likelihood that they're trying to usurp Kang as the big bad for the end of these movies, you wouldn't have a lot of time to otherwise develop Dr. Doom. Let's get, let's get him out there. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious at the very least, I would say I'm not openly excited, but this is the most I've been open to being excited about a Marvel thing in a minute. I was like, you know what? I actually am curious to where this is going to go. I'll check it out. I'd like to see this. This seems nice. Um, 
I like, I really like the little piece of art. Like it's not great. It's not you know, groundbreaking, but just the fact that they did it and the way they announced it, like on Valentine's day and it's kind of sweet. Like I hope that is indicative of the idea that the movie will have its own interesting vibe. I don't know if it will, but I kind of hope it does. I think that'd be cool. I think that'd be really nice. Uh, but, uh, the other stuff, Super Bowl related, I guess, in the news is just a lot of movie trailers coming out this week. We had the trailer for Twisters, a sequel to Twister that appears to have no real serious tether to the original Twister. Twister is one of my favorite movies of all time. It's one of the greatest movies ever made. I never thought the guy that did Minari was going to make a sequel, but he, he did. He did. It has a pretty good cast. It has the potential to be pretty good. Uh, the trailer I thought was pretty well done. I'm, I'm open to it. I hope it's good. I want to see it. And then um, there was the trailer for Wicked, which I've never, I'm not a big musical guy, so I've never been to see Wicked. I'm familiar with the idea that it's like a alternate retelling of The Wizard of Oz or whatever. That trailer looks fucking horrendous. Like, it looks really bad. Uh, it looks like crazy bad. Like, I cannot believe how bad it looks. Um, it just looks like shit to me. And like, again, another musical where the marketing is just like trying to hide that it's a musical, even though I think anyone that knows it would have to know it's a musical, but like, they just don't want to show you anybody singing in these fucking trailers. Um, but I guess the one that the real one that we got to talk about that people are up in arms about is Deadpool and Wolverine. Uh, Deadpool three has been retitled to Deadpool and Wolverine since Hugh Jackman's in it. <laughs> and the entire trailer kind of builds up to the idea that he's in it without showing him, even though we've all seen all this shit from all the like leaked press photos and whatnot. Uh, set photos, I mean, and, um, like I only watched the trailer the one time I didn't re look, I didn't rewatch it to look at Easter eggs or whatever. Cause like, I liked the first Deadpool. I thought it was pretty fun. I thought Deadpool two had its moments. Like I thought it was also entertaining enough, but I've never been a Deadpool guy. I'm not crazy about Deadpool. I understand that Ryan Reynolds is so perfect for the part, but it's like Deadpool as a guy just winking at the camera and like being weird and stuff is like to me it's it's fun in doses. So like I don't know that I needed three fucking movies with him in it. Like my favorite Deadpool thing ever is actually um uh when Rick Remender was writing uh Uncanny X Force, I think. Uh and the team lineup was like Phantom X, uh Angel, Psylocke and a couple other people, but, but Deadpool was on the, in, in, the, in the team and the way that Remender used Deadpool in that run, I thought was always really fun because he had the energy and like the goofiness and the, and the fourth wall breaking, but there's also sort of like a wounded like vibe to him that made him more interesting. And like everything about, I really liked that run a lot. I haven't revisited in a long time, so I don't know if it holds up. I loved, uh, Jerome Opinion's art on the book too. But that made me think, like, that's a cool way to use Deadpool. That's kind of how I feel about Wolverine, too, is, like, some of these characters are really cool in supporting roles. I feel like they, they do their best work as part of a larger ensemble. I like Wolverine. I don't like a lot of Wolverine solo stuff. I like when he's a part of the team and he's over there in the corner. Uh, Deadpool, I kind of feel the same way. Like, if Deadpool's part of a larger ensemble and he's, like, the comic relief, that's cool. But if he's the main thing and he's just constantly looking at the camera and being, like, Hey, a pegging joke. You guys ever think about butts before or whatever? It's just like, okay, we get it. You're so edgy and different. Oh my God. Like it just doesn't do anything for me. So kudos to Ryan Reynolds for getting to make an R rated movie within the MCU, you know, well played. I don't know how Sean Levy ended up being the director for it. Other than that, I guess they became buddies on free guy, a movie I genuinely liked and defend a lot. So maybe this will end up being okay. But the trailer didn't still with a lot of confidence. The moment in the trailer that I want to talk about that really kind of made me go, yeah, we got to wrap this shit up, is they show Pyro from X2 and X3 The Last Stand. And that actor, his name I think is Aaron Stanford. Stafford? He was in, he was in a movie called Tadpole. It was like an indigent release that John Ritter is in, I think, and B.B. Newworth. It was like a big indie that was one of the, one of the early indies that got sold at a festival despite being shot on mini DV. Uh, I've always, I know it's, it sounds goofy, but I just, I remember him as the guy from tadpole. Uh, even though maybe being pyro and X-Men is probably his biggest role, whatever. Anyway, he's in it and it's like, Hey, look, remember, remember pyro from X2 and X3, the last stand. And that actor has clearly aged like 20 fucking years has passed. And he has not aged. I don't want to say he's aged, he didn't age well. I don't want to imply that he's like, I don't, I don't like looks shaming people or whatever. I don't think he's, I'm not saying he looks ugly. 
but he looks haggard a little bit. He looks like he looks weary, I'll say. And I, I it, it's not, it, I saw people like popping for this online. Like they're like, Oh my God, it's pyro. And like, I, he was, he was good in those movies as a cool character. Maybe one of the better versions of pyro in a story ever, I suppose. But like, is that what we're doing? Is that where we are with all this multiversal stuff is like, Oh look, it's pyro from X2 and X3, the last stand. We are, are we really scraping? This is like, you know, eating a whole bag of Doritos in one sitting is pretty fun. Like they're delicious. Almost every form of Dorito is pretty good. But when you get to the bottom of the bag and it's just the crunchy, like it's just like the crumbs, you can, they, the crumbs are still good. You're going to finish the whole bag. You're going to, you know, you're going to tint it, like tilt it into your mouth to get the other parts of it. But once you get down to the dregs, man, it's not quite as fun as the rest of it was. There's no more full chips. None of them are full anymore. They're, none of them are the full triangular shape. It's just crumbs. And to me, having Pyro from X2 and X3 to the Last Stand be a big return in a trailer during the Super Bowl, that's crumbs, man. We are at Dorito crumb level uh, for the MCU. And if you're into that, bully for you. If you're not, I then come sit next to me. We, we, can, we can commiserate together. Uh, about a month ago, when I realized that Deadpool 3, Deadpool and Wolverine is going to be the only Marvel movie coming out in the year, I was like, and what happens if it isn't even, like, does it even do well? Then I saw the reaction to this trailer, and I was like, never mind, this movie's going to make $4 billion. Th- like, it's it, it's it's sort of like the MCU's, like, last secret weapon is, like, if they could have got the Joker, and, like, if, like, the only other thing that, the only other thing they could have on their sleeve is, like, if they could also get Joaquin Phoenix Joker to be in a Marvel movie before the end of next year, that would maybe also save them. Uh, but no, I'm pretty sure Deadpool is going to make just an offensive amount of money. Like the, the, that, that part of the audience is gonna, it, it already seems so excited that like, you know, they don't see any, no, no wokeism coming into this movie. Nothing, nothing too woke, nothing ruining our superhero stuff. Like I think they're going to eat this shit up and more power to them, I guess. But this feels like the last, last dying gasp. You know what I mean? Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Pyro. All right. Uh, so that's it for the news. We're going to talk about what I watched. Um, like I said, we're going to talk about that movie. We're going to talk about it. But first, I want to talk a little bit about a wrestling thing that happened this week that I got very excited about. Um, I uh, So I also had to work Monday night. Like I had, a, I had a weird schedule this week. So I missed Monday Night Raw. I usually am home. I usually... I'm usually, I usually bleh, I usually am home on Monday nights. I tend to watch Monday Night Raw. Even if throughout its three-hour telecast, I tend to tune out for a lot of it. I was not home. I did not watch Raw. But when I got home, I was on uh, on good old TikTok. And someone had uploaded a promo that I'd missed from the episode. And unfortunately, I had to watch it on split screen with some fucking... Some wrestling content creator, like, talking over it. which was just like, oh my god, shut the fuck up, dude. Please, guys, if I ever get into the point where I'm making content where it's just me talking while something else is playing and I'm not actually making any jokes or doing anything of value, I'm just kind of like mugging for the views, I would play this clip at me later or just call me names or something. Like, I don't ever want to be that person. And I know that that's part of how the game is played and that works for certain people. But just seeing this guy talking over this fucking thing I'm trying to watch for the first time is just killing me. Luckily, uh, the promo was so well received that WWE released the entire segment onto YouTube so I could watch it on YouTube like normal. But it was the nine o'clock hour, top of the nine o'clock hour, the second hour of the three hour raw. And uh, Cody Rhodes, like I said, talked about last week, is getting his match against Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 40. He's going to finish the story or try to. And at that press conference thing they did, they, they really, really got uh, Seth Rollins like into this story like he's he's been like kicked around Seth Rollins being the other uh world champion in the in the promotion who is not the bigger world champion because he's holding a belt that's less than a year old he's doing his best to give it prestige but you know it's not there yet and I thought it was so shitty of them to like make so much of the story about the fact that Seth sucks it's just like yeah Seth's just kind of like a bitch and a loser and his belt is lame and he walks funny because he's always injured and he's nowhere near as great as Roman and so much of professional wrestling storytelling is like, y- you don't really want to denigrate someone, but so much because you kill the story, you know, like if you and I are, if I'm a wrestler and you're a wrestler, we're cut, I'm cutting a promo on you. And I'm like, this lame dick fucking loser. He can't fight. He's a, he's this, he's that. Da, da, da. I'm going to beat him. 
That doesn't sound impressive anymore. Because I just said this guy fucking sucks and he's a nobody. So me saying I'm going to beat him is just no, that's of no value. It's like, why are you even fighting that guy? He sounds like a loot. Like, why are you even wasting your time with him? You're supposed to kind of build your opponent up. So like, you can say, I don't fucking like you. You know what I mean? He's, I hate this guy. He hit my mom or something. But you kind of also have to throw in like, but he's a hell of a competitor. <laughs> like, I think he's a, I think he's a low down dog, but he can fight. And I'm just going to fight him better. You know, that's the, like the fucking the general idea for like how wrestling is supposed to work. Uh, so having like Roman just eviscerate Seth on the, on the mic and call him all sorts of losers, which just didn't make, make no, no sense to me whatsoever, but they had, they give him a little moment, uh, when the rock turned heel at the press conference and he slapped Cody where like Seth jumped into it and Cody's a guy that he like, doesn't really fuck with. They're not, you know, they, they, you know, in, in character, I suppose. Uh, and maybe in real life too, uh, they don't really fuck with each other, you know, but he was just like ready to, to scrap for this guy, you know? And when they, sh- they uh, WWE had a, uh, a Super Bowl commercial for WrestleMania 40, and in the commercial, it's like The Rock and Roman facing off against Cody and Seth. I was like, Seth's in the fucking commercial? It's kind of crazy. Um, so like, it felt like, well, th- something's got to be going on with him, like where he's going to be a part of the larger story. Um, he was originally sort of slated to have a big match with CM Punk night one of WrestleMania, which would have been really fun, but Punk got hurt. Seth is also hurt, but he's like hurt enough to where he'll probably be okay by mania. So they need stuff for him to do. He can't really have matches, but they don't want him to vacate the title. So all he can really do is come out and talk, I guess. But Seth is a performer who to me is, I think he's really great in the ring. He's not like he used to be faster and more fluid, like before a lot of injuries and he's older now. I don't think he's like worse, but there's, he's not quite as magical as he used to be. But he's still good. I still think he's very good. And I like a lot of his character work, even though sometimes he gets into these weird pockets where he's like just doing too much and doesn't really work for me. But I enjoy him. I like watching him. I like watching him talk and like watching him work. Uh, didn't know how they were going to fix this because they made him seem like such a loser, just uh, such a loser. And Cody opened up the the, sh- the nine o'clock hour talking about The Rock, talking about Roman, all this different stuff. And then Seth comes out and Seth and him have this great back and forth. It's almost all Seth talking actually. And Seth essentially is like, look, you know, we don't see eye to eye. We're not, you know, really friends, but like, I respect you. You you work hard and you might be the last person who can take that belt off of Roman. Cause if he wins, he's going to have more power. He's going to be able to show up whenever he wants. He's not going to defend things fairly. It might be you or no one, or he'll just be here forever. And like, you couldn't beat him last time. And this time now he's hitched his wagon to the only other guy as selfish and powerful as him, like the rock. Now it's like, you're facing both of these guys. And it's like, he's really building it up. Like you fucking lost last year. What what is your plan? How are you going to do better this time around? But he's building it up and building it up. And he starts talking about, you know, he says, you don't have to do this alone. And the crowd's kind of like, okay, all right, what's going on here. And he, he gets in this whole bit about how he's personally responsible for why Roman is the way Roman is. Cause, uh, Seth and, and Roman and, uh, John Moxley, who's no longer in the companies in AW began as a, 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 a team called the shield. And Roman was like the least experienced guy in the team. And Seth was sort of the most experienced at the time, I guess slightly more than, than Moxley. And, um, or no, they might've been the, whatever he, he was story wise. He was like the, the, the mind of the operation. So the idea is that like he taught Roman everything he knows as a wrestler and then he betrayed him. He turned on his brothers and that betrayal is what made Roman so fundamentally paranoid and manipulative because he doesn't trust people. Like the closest thing he ever had, like a friend betrayed him. So now he only wants his family around and he's going to manipulate them into always doing whatever he wants. He, he, he doesn't trust people. And it's made him like a really great villain character. So the idea of Seth being like, I'm responsible for this. And now he's holding the whole company hostage like you're the guy to beat him, I guess. But like you, you have to, you have to fight off all these people now and you don't have to fight them alone. And like, he builds up to this moment where he's like, you know, I'm, there's one person who's the most uniquely suited to be your shield. And you know, a call back to the fact that he was in a group called the shield. It's very basic and cheesy, but like, man, that line hit, I got goosebumps. I've watched this promo like four times <laughs> since Monday. And I was just so, it was like in the course of like eight minutes, 
they, I don't want to say they undid because those other segments are terrible, but they instantly made Seth a big deal again. They have him aligned with like the biggest hero in the show. So now he seems cool again. Um, the fact that he's like setting aside his pay differences to want to focus on this common goal. We don't know what this, we don't know what, how this is going to manifest, right? I don't know how, what, how it's going to pay off, but the fact that they put him in a position where now he feels like he's a part of this huge story, I think was really good, really solid. And it had me excited. Like, and also he was getting the last couple of weeks, man, he was not getting the reactions he used to get. Like they really made him seem like a fucking nobody. And he got great reactions. Like they, they, crowd was fired up it's i think probably the best promo of seth's career before this i was a really big fan of uh he's the only person from this run of roman's title reign that roman did not beat seth won the match they had by disqualification because roman just beat him with a chair until they made him stop and in the promo building up to that match they had a really good promo of like seth being like you've never really beat me when it matters like i've always got your number i tell you everything you know and it was a really fun thing because Seth's whole, uh, so much of the, his the current version of his character has been influenced by the Joker a little bit. So it really had that feeling of like when the Joker's fucking with Batman. It was really fun. This was better. This was so impassioned. He didn't fall into quite as much of his like goofy stuff. He seemed like a legit guy. He seemed like a real hero. Like it really, they really are building up the end of Roman's reign <laughs> to, to feeling like, I mean, I keep seeing people saying that like, WrestleMania 39 and 40 is like Avengers Infinity War and Endgame, which is a bit corny. But like that does feel like they're building up this up to be like an endgame moment. Like there's so many heroes that all fell trying to stop this guy. And Cody, like the best hero, is gonna do it. And he might have to put together a team of all the other guys who also have a bone to pick. And I don't know how they're gonna really pull that off and how they're gonna pay it off exactly, but I'm excited to see how it goes. And the the reason I wanted to talk about this wasn't just because I like the promo. It's there's this thing in wrestling, especially in wrestling discourse on the internet, where people think that promos don't, I don't want to say it's that promos don't matter, but there's this thing where it's like, there's this assumption that if you like, if you prefer WWE, that's what you like to watch, that you don't really care about wrestling because so much of the show is just guys talking. It's just like a soap opera. So you don't really like wrestling. It's that you don't care about in-ring action. You just care about 30 minute promos. And it's a criticism that is born from in the like early 2010s, what Raw went through a period where it was it was a difficult show to watch because every episode would open up with someone coming out and talking for like a half an hour, and the promo was usually weren't as good. They didn't go anywhere. They didn't set anything up. It was just people fucking jawing. It was annoying. It was just time filling. The show isn't really function that way anymore. Like there are still a lot of talking segments. It, it, you know, it's not just match, 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 match. Just three hours. They they, they mix it up, and the the talking parts are designed to make the fighting parts matter more. That's like the purpose of, of a promo. It's to like sell an event or sell you to come see something. And it's part of the storytelling for it, right? And currently most of the most, most of the big promo segments hit. They're usually pretty good. They're very rarely are they are they pointless. And if you watch uh AW like the kind of the only competition, I guess, they're like the opposite. It's like no, there's almost never promos. <laughs> They'll announce the entire match card on Instagram an hour before the show airs, and then it's just match, 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 match. There'll be little angles here and there and stuff that happens, and sometimes there'll be promos. They're usually backstage. They're usually really, really brief. And it's like so much of what AEW does to be different feels like an overcorrection. It's like, oh, well, WWE, they, their promos are too long. We're not going to have any. <laughs> And it's like, maybe just find a middle ground. Like you can still do promos, you know? And like, and, and, and when they did start having longer in-ring segments that were talking, people were like, this sucks. It's because it's trying to be like WWE. And like those segments didn't suck because they were WWE style. They sucked because they weren't good segments. And to, well, to a certain segment of fan, they only know that like, well, this is like WWE and I hate WWE. So this is bad. And it's like, well, no, sometimes things are bad because they're bad. Like you can... It's like, I don't know if you ever, if you ever have to talk to like a young writer or like a young, especially like a young screenwriter, there are these people who hate three act structure and they're like, Oh, I hate it. It's so obvious. So easy. so simple. You know, I need something different. And then like they, they'll write something that's all over the place, but it's original. It doesn't fucking work. It does not function. Like it does not, it does not, it, it's, it's a, it's a faulty house based on a bad foundation, but at least it's original. It's not that thing they hate. And it's like, if you've seen a lot of boring movies that follow the three act structure, the problem is those movies were boring. Not that they followed the three-act structure. 
it's they didn't they didn't do it well you know so when i see people make this complaint that like there's too much talking in wrestling there's not enough wrestling and wrestling there's this one particular uh Tori user who like i just i hate and like that sometimes their stuff just pops on my feed and it makes me mad every time they really are a much more into like the the wrestling side of wrestling like just the matches just the in-ring stuff and it's also very important obviously but they have this belief that it's like you know you don't need promos to tell a story people can just tell stories in the ring they don't have to ha- talk or ever go to the microphone you can tell it in the ring that's that's what now that's the way pro wrestling works you should be able to watch a match even if you don't know anybody and then what they do in the ring will tell you all you need to know to tell the story and the problem is that like people that champion AEW, most of the wrestlers that work there don't do that. They don't have a lot of storytelling or psychology in their matches. A lot of times they just have a lot of, you know, choreographed, you know, sometimes exciting sequences, but there's not really a story at play. Or sometimes there is a story, but the story is like really dumb. (laughs) And I just found it interesting to me that people have, have, especially now that it's WrestleMania season, so everything's going to have the WWE sheen of epicness over it. It's like the greatest of all time, the greatest this, the greatest that. Like that's how they present things. They're promoted. It's promoting, you know? And people are going to be like, yeah, but like, you know, real wrestling doesn't have to have all that stuff. You just have good matches and that's all that matters. And it's like, or specifically they try to say it's more sports based. It's like, it's more like real sports. And it's like, I sort of understand what you're trying to say, but please look at the world of real sports. The UFC is, is, is as successful as it is because they promote things the way WWE promotes it's they use pro wrestling tactics like Conor McGregor didn't become so famous because he's in himself is such an exemplary unique fighter he also had a smart mouth and he had like the, like a persona that made you want to fucking see him get punched you know like the fucking the Super Bowl or, or any 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 sport anytime the NBA finals shows up and the two teams that are facing off are, are, are two teams that have no kind of narrative or chemistry or whatever or like there's not any specific players who have narratives that have been going on the whole season nobody cares people tend to tune out of the finals if it's two teams that don't have a story going of some sort like people loved or maybe some people were sick of it but i think people loved you know the the multi-year arc of lebron with various teams against the warriors and stuff you know i mean people really ate that shit up um and it's because even in sports even in athletics we like storytelling we like stories you know, uh, I, I, I've been listening to more like sports stuff, like on TV in the background lately, especially like lead up to the Super Bowl. And so much of the discussion about the game was not the mechanics of the game. So much of the discussion of the game is talking about Patrick Mahomes, what his legacy is, what is it, his stats versus his, the myth of him and stuff like there's, it's all story. Those aren't things that are just like scientific things. It's, it's, it's story, you know? So uh, I think I understand the people that maybe don't watch as much wrestling think like, Oh, it's so much. It's, it's like a soap opera. And like, yeah, I guess, but like everything's kind of like a soap opera. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like rap music is like this. Like so many different things are like this. There is like a spectacle and there's a story and there's, there's an intrigue to it beyond the main thing. You know what I mean? And I think that it's important to like, if you see something like that, that's bad, then yeah, that, that's bad. It's bad that it's a bad story. But the fact that there is one is not a bad thing, you know, and um, I don't know, I'm just kind of I'm kind of sick and tired of people denigrating this entire style of storytelling and, because they are salty about some stuff from like 12 years ago. Like they're like, oh, I hated it. when I was at 15. I hated how they did this. It's like, OK, but they don't do it that way anymore. So what the fuck are you whining about? So I don't know. I hate that. But I love that promo. And I love I love the talking part of wrestling. I think there's so many. I love rewatching old promos. I love just watching someone like just through speaking and like facial expressions and like body language, watching them twist 20,000 people up at once. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's like a theater. It's a theater in a way that I, even I think most regular plays don't necessarily do. Um, there's something about it that I think is very, very raw and primal and I'm, I'm so drawn to it. So when I watch a wrestling show that's just a cool match, then a cool match, and then a cool match, I don't give a fuck about anybody in it or anything that's going on. I'm just like, this isn't working for me. You know what I mean? Like some guys are good enough to transcend not being good promos or not talking or not doing the soap opera side of it. That's fine. Not all of them are. And a lot of the ones that think they are, aren't. It just turns into one of those Super Bowls or NBA Finals with two teams. And you're like, oh, 
I'm sure they both play very well. I'm sure this is going to be a great contest of athleticism, but I don't fucking care. I don't have anybody to root for. I don't, I don't have anybody to root against. You know, so much of pro wrestling is you need someone to root for and someone to root against. It's an emotional thing. When you're just watching two guys that you think are good and they're both just slugging it out, that can be fun sometimes too. But I don't think it should just be the the norm. It, it doesn't. It doesn't. It, it does not create the emotional response that leads to like growth and leads to converting people into being lifelong fans and leads to people spending money, you know, um, which is what they need to make this thing work. So, yeah. Anyway, let's fucking talk about it, guys. I saw Madam Web. <sighs> so here's the thing: I hadn't watched a movie all week. And I was just like, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I'll find a show to binge or something. I didn't. So today I was like, man, I'll just go see Madam Web after work. I'll just go. And I thought about going, it's playing at the theater across my apartment. And I was like, oh, I don't want to buy a ticket to fucking Madam Web. I don't want to financially support Madam Web. So we had a show at four o'clock at my theater that I work at. So, um, I had to get there early to let some people in to do some, some work on some stuff. So I was like, I guess I can technically leave early. If I came in early, I'll just watch Madam Web here. And I watched Madam Web for free and I still kind of want my money back. It's not a good movie. Okay. Like it's, it's, it's not a good movie, but what makes me mad is it is not a good movie in a way that is not like fun. And a lot of times in recent years that a movie has been like universally reviled by critics and people and they make memes about how bad it is. A lot of times when you finally watch the movie, you're like, this isn't even worth all of that. You know, it's like, this isn't good, but it not is not necessarily worth like the vitriol and the ridicule. Like this just shouldn't exist. And I miss when things were bad in a way that was like fun or something was bad in a way that was impressive. You know what I mean? Like, I miss things like the book of Henry, you know, when something sucks, I want it to be like, I want it to be so convoluted or strange that it's like, it's a curio, you know? And when I watch something that's just not good, I'm like, oh, that wasn't good. <laughs> Don't know why they did that, you know? And like, it, you, you just end up being more confounded than anything else. So I think that what's unfortunate about Madam Web is that like the trailers were pretty bad. And then people started making jokes and like, and, and memes and stuff and kind of like building it up, like trying to make it like Morbius or whatever. And then you watch the movie itself and you're like, it's, it's not good, <laughs> but it's not bad enough to be special. You know, like, I don't think I'm going to remember this in like a couple of weeks or, or tomorrow. So I watched the whole movie. Um, when, it, when, it, when the movie opens up, <laughs> There's this thing about all the Sony Spider-Man movies is that they have to show the Marvel logo and it's the same Marvel logo they show before Marvel movies. And it just feels really disingenuous because <laughs> they cut to that to a little credit being like in association with Marvel. That's like they're involved. They don't really want to be, but contractually, if they want to keep having Tom Holland run around in those little fucking suits, they have to put up with us, you know? It's this like real, real nasty tone. That's like, yeah, yeah, fuck, we got a Craven movie coming. You guys just have to deal with it. So, the movie itself, uh, it, I would say it's more ambitious than any of the other Sony Spider things, in the sense that they really are trying to do the most possible with the least amount of Spider-Man, like. Taking a movie about one of his villains, like like the Venom movies, for instance, like the Venom movies function on their own. You don't need to even allude to Spider-Man really. Like Venom as a character, like it's pretty, like, it works. And Tom Hardy's really good. And there's enough there that they don't have to like even lean on references as much. This is a movie where like, <laughs> I guess I'll just say straight up, there's going to be spoilers for this because I don't know, there's no point in discussing it if I'm trying to keep anything secret. But one of the key things about this movie is that Adam Scott plays Uncle Ben, like Peter Parker's Uncle Ben. Uh, he's like a prominent character in the movie. He's like one of the main characters in the movie. And throughout the whole movie, there's just these little digs and lines that are meant for, hey, you know who that is? You know, you know what's going to come for him? And they get more and more insulting as the movie progresses. So like in his first scene, uh, well, I guess, let me, let me, let me not get ahead of myself. 
you know, Dakota Johnson stars this movie as Cassie Webb, uh, Madam Webb. Madam Webb, as some of you know, is a Spider-Man character uh, who is like an old lady who can like sees visions and shit. She's kind of like a like an advisor for Spider-Man in some ways. So this is like her origin ish, um, and she has to uh, the plot of the movie. She has to protect these three young teenage girls who, in the future, are each going to become Spider-themed heroes. So, uh, one of them is Julia Carpenter, whatever her name is. It's Sydney Sweeney. She's one of the spider women characters, like from the nineties, I guess. I think she was from the nineties. And then another actress is playing, uh, Aranya, the spider heart. who's like a smart science girl who gets spider powers. And then Maddie Franklin is like a different version of, of a spider woman or spider girl character. Basically, in the future, they're all going to be spider-esque characters, and they're all going to fight this villain, Ezekiel, who's the villain of the movie. He's played by Tar Rahim, who is an actor who uh, is really great in Jacques Odiard's The Prophet, like one of my favorite movies ever. It's not done very much since, but he's fantastic in A Prophet. Uh, and he's here, and he's getting a paycheck, so that's nice. But he plays Ezekiel, and when we, when we, uh, there's an episode of The Power where I talked about the trailer for this movie, and I referred to his character as Ezekiel Stain. Uh, which is Obadiah Stane's son from Matt Fraction's Iron Man run. And maybe most of you didn't catch that, but I, I was re-listening to that uh, recently for some reason, and I was so mad at myself. I was cringing. I was like, oh my God, some other nerd is going to think I don't know the difference between these two characters, and it's going to be embarrassing for me. But no one called me out on it. So if you knew that, if you caught that, and you didn't give me shit for it, that was very nice of you. Um, but I gave myself shit for it. Anyway. Ezekiel is a character from the Spider-Man comics from J. Michael Straczynski's Amazing Spider-Man run, uh, who was like sort of a, like a, I don't know, like an anti-hero. He's like, he's like a, he's an older guy who also has Peter's powers and he encourages Peter to look at his world differently. But the, the huge pitch of, of Straczynski's run, the, the big bombshell that happens in the first issue is Peter meets this old guy who has the same powers as him. He's trying to figure out how he has the same powers and the guy's like, How'd you get your powers? And he's like, well, a radioactive spider bit me. And then Peter's, uh, the guy's like, oh, well, how do you, did the radioactivity give that spider the ability to give you these powers? Or was that spider destined to give you powers anyway? And the radio, the radiation killed it. And it's at this big, oh my God, like a gunshot to my chest. What, what does this all mean? And it it, 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 it creates this whole story where they, they, they go into these other ideas about how like the totems and stuff and the reason Peter, all of his villains are animal themes because he's a spider and the other ones represent other animals and it's all this stuff trying to go back to like folklore and look, it was, it was like, it was like 2001 creator Babylon five wanted to, to shake things up with Spider-Man. There's some good stuff in there. It's some bad stuff in there, whatever. But Ezekiel's like a good guy for the most part. He's like an old, old, old guy who kind of reminded him of his uncle Ben. Like that was a big thing when the character got introduced was like, is this uncle Ben back from like back from the dead or something? So to have him here in a movie and be like Tahar Rahim, like just a hot guy, but now he's like sleazy and evil, kind of strange. Uh, and Tahar Rahim is responsible for killing Cassie's mom in Peru in the seventies. Like she's pregnant with, with Cassie and he shoots her to steal a spider from her. And then the Aranyas, like these like uh, spider people in, of the Amazon who look vaguely like the Spider-Man costumes, uh, save the baby, Cassie, and then the mother dies. And then she grows up in foster care. She's a paramedic uh, and she's like best friends with Ben, Adam Scott's lovable coworker guy. And every scene that Ben is in it has some kind of fucking line about who that really is. So like... They're driving through Queens. He's talking about being in the army. And she's like, what's the matter? You've never been shot at in Queens. And it's like, oh yeah. Cause he, he dies in the future in Queens. Um, then he like takes her to a cookout, but the cookout is a baby shower for his sister, Mary, who's having a baby. It's Peter. Oh my God. Like just every fucking scene, every goddamn scene is like this. Uh, and it just, <clears throat> there's so many things about this movie that don't make any sense. Like, when they jump to 2003, there's like this awkward, like, yeah, yeah, yeah's needle drop where I was like, this is a song you're going to, I think it was the, yeah, yeah, I was like, this is a song you're going to, th- this is how you're going to do the time jump. And then like Mike Epps is in it as like one of the other paramedic people that they're, they're friends with. And he's like supposed to be comic relief and his like one scene. Uh, 
the whole deal is that she, Cassie Webb, again, her fucking last name is Webb. Uh, Cassie ends up getting hurt, like trying to save someone. And then she like technically dies for like three minutes. And when she comes back, she starts having these visions. Like she can see things into the very near future, like a few minutes into the future, but she can't control it at first. So it's just disorienting. And the, the, the structure, not the structure, the, the style of the movie is such that like, uh, it's directed by S.J. Clarkson, who I think directed a lot of episodes like Jessica Jones and stuff. Uh, she tries to create this visual language where every time, every time Cassie is like intr- intruded upon by like a vision, it feels very like traumatic and like visceral and like just like kind of comes in from nowhere. But it also just makes some of the editing like really incomprehensible. Like just the visual language is very muddied, but it's supposed to make you kind of feel like she's just being bombarded by these visions. She can't, doesn't know what to do about them. There's this really weird, like when you first, when the movie first starts, like when, when Taha Rahim is like pulling a gun on, when Ezekiel's pulling a gun on, on Cassie's mom, the camera keeps cutting back and forth between the two of them, but it's kind of like doing these like digital push in zooms. Like you're watching like handheld digital video footage, but it's very haphazard and it just, it's like, do you remember like this started becoming a thing in the early two thousands where like even stuff shot in space or stuff that was shot like with fantastical elements, they would have like kind of shaky handheld footage to make it feel more real, but it would just make it more weird. Like I feel like Serenity or like Firefly did this a lot with the, with the space stuff would have these little, little push-ins. They do that like seven times in the scene. (laughs) And it just gets worse from there. But uh, she's at this fucking baby shower. And there's a moment where she's having to explain that her mother died, died in childbirth at a baby shower. And it's supposed to be really awkward and uncomfortable. But Dakota Johnson plays Cassie like a person who hates everything that's going on in her life. Like she's just, she's a loner. She's friends with Ben, but she doesn't like to do anything else. She doesn't like to be connected to people. She's, she just does her own thing. She thinks her mom hated her and that's why she died giving birth. It's very strange. So her getting these visions of having to save these girls ultimately is like, oh, she has to learn to overcome not being connected to people to take responsibility for people because uh, life is just one big intricate web and we're all connected to one another and we have a certain responsibility to each other as human beings. Like We genuinely, even those people we don't know, we're in some way responsible for them because we're all just humans. Uh that's a beautiful uh, idea. You know what I mean? I think it's, I think it's true. I think we are kind of all, we're all we got in this world, you know? Unfortunately, this movie is fucking stupid and doesn't really hammer that stuff home the way you think it might. Instead, you just have to watch this se- severely annoyed woman in her early 30s just be mad at teenagers that she has to save and just be annoyed at everything that's happening. Uh... So like the, the, when they're doing the scene of her being awkward, at the baby shower, it's not like, Oh, isn't this awkward that this lady who isn't friends with anybody doesn't know how to interact with people. Instead, it's sort of like her being annoyed that they're annoyed. Like she just seems like, okay, yeah, my mom died. What do you want? Like, it's a very strange characterization, but she starts to figure out her prophetic visions and she starts figuring out that she has some kind of power. She gets on a train to go somewhere. And then all those, these three girls end up on the train together Ezekiel comes to kill them. She runs away and tries to save them. Now, a, a big chunk of this movie is just them on the run and her trying to protect these girls. And one of the things that makes it so frustrating is that there's just no sense of realism to... Not that this movie needs to be real. I'm not, obviously, this movie is goofy. But I mean, like, it's... It's it's one of those things that's like... It's, this isn't... It's not that this isn't realistic. It's that it's insulting to my intelligence to expect me to watch this. So, like... One of the most egregious moments in the movie to me that really, really hammers this home is that uh, she, she keeps having to stash them someplace so that they won't be seen by Ezekiel while she goes off to figure out what's going on. But she never figures out what's going on. So every time she leaves them alone, some new thing has to happen. She has to rush back to save them. And there's a point where she's stashing them at like uh, this motel. And she's looking through her mother's like diary about her spider research and realizes that it's all connected because she sees a picture of her mother and it's with the guy that, that's chasing them. And she's like trying to piece it all together. And one of the girls is like, Cassie, are you going to leave us again? And she's like, I have to figure out what is going on. And she dumps the girls at Ben's house to go to Peru. 
All this time, they're on the run. She is driving them around in a stolen cab. She steals a cab from a cab driver and then pries the license plates off of it, I guess, to not to be undetected. She's driving around in a license plateless cab. Two years after 9-11, this movie set in 2003, a movie where much of the backdrop of the movie is Ezekiel having like a girl in the chair, a computer hacker person played by Josia Mamet from Girls. And she's like, he's give, he's he like kills a woman from the NSA to get their NSA stuff for how they get all the facial recognition shit. So he's, she's, he, they keep finding the girls by using all the NSA facial recognition stuff that like everyone has now, but didn't used to be regular. And I'm like, even though that wasn't fully like uh, normalized at the time, you can't drive around New York City with a fucking car with no fucking license plates. Like, especially because, like, they imply that, like, the cops and everyone knows what she looks like. So she's just, like, driving around in a stolen car. And then we want me to believe that she... It just cuts from her saying, I have to go to Peru, to her being... I mean, well, they, it cut, they, she drops him off at, at Ben's first, but... It just cuts to her in Peru. I'm like, how the fuck did she get to Peru? Like, I, that's... Whatever. It's... <sighs> It's that kind of movie. Okay. It's that kind of movie. And I just didn't, here's the problem with the movie. Okay. The trailers for the movie show you a lot of exciting scenes of the various spider women, people fighting Ezekiel, who looks like evil, dark black flash Spider-Man. And those are like visions from the future. They never happen. You just see a handful of visions of what the future is going to be like in the present day. The action is just them running from this guy who has all this power and then it not working. And then Dakota Johnson getting a second go at it like a video game because she had a vision of it. So it's just that over and over again, them running from this guy or driving away from this guy or whatever. And it's just not very exciting. And like the, the these set pieces aren't constructed creatively enough to overcome the fact that it's just a, a, a 30 year old lady and some teenagers just running from a guy for like the whole fucking movie, you know, and no amount of cutting to jokes about Ben Parker and how he's going to die is going to make up for that. You know, like part of it is that Madam Webb has never been like a, the main character of something. She's always in a web, unable to move around and be functional. And then Peter comes to her for advice and she's like, Peter, I see everything. You need to watch out for this. That's what she does. She, she can't be the main character of, or she shouldn't be the main character of a movie. Like making her younger and like attractive or whatever, and then but still functionally having like the ability. It's just I think Nick Cage's power in the movie knowing, you know what I mean? It's just basically that. It doesn't work, you know. And they try to give each of the girls like enough of like a distinct character to be interesting, but all of their scenes are very strange, disjointed. Everyone's kind of like a dick to each other, not in believable ways. The closest the movie comes to me to being like creatively interesting is she stashes the girl, there's a scene where she stashes the girls in the woods and then she goes to try to figure out what's going on. So she leaves them alone in the woods with like no food. <laughs> and the girls get together and wander off from the woods to a diner. When they get to the diner, um, there's a bunch of boys there and they go to flirt with the boys. And this is all happening set to Britney Spears' Toxic. And uh, Cassie gets there to save them from Ezekiel, but she's too late and like he kills all of them. But then she gets a second go of it because that was just a vision. And... Uh, so now she's like driving the cab through the woods to get to the diner to, to save their lives because she knows it's about to happen. But because the thing went down at a specific moment in the song Toxic, she's driving in the cab playing that radio station's playing Toxic that they're playing at the diner. And she's speeding up because she knows like this part of the song is coming up and that's when they're going to get killed. And I was like, oh, this is like actually pretty like that's actually kind of it's not bad. It's actually interesting, uh, but it's not executed very well. It's just not. And the whole movie's edited pretty pretty roughly as if it's been through lots of lots of cuts and lots of changes and stuff. Other than that, like the third act when she finally unlocks the full power of her powers or whatever, where she's just running through like, hey, do this. Why? Because I know this thing's about to fall. So when I tell you duck, watch out or like stuff like that. That whole scene is like uh, not great. Um, but they also throw in the fact that like Mary uh, is pregnant and she's about to go into labor. So like they're running from this guy and Peter Parker is about to be born. <laughs> so they throw in that extra thing for you too. And it's all very strange. But when, when she has to, I'm all over the place with this plot because it's so fucking nonsense. She, when she goes to Peru, this guy gives her like this vision quest thing, showing her like 
She's like, you know, why, why did this happen? He's like, you know, well, this is before you were born. She, Cause she's never understood. Why did my mom, while I was pregnant, go to the fucking Amazon to study spiders and get killed? What, what an idiot. And the big reveal is that, uh, her mom, when she was pregnant, she, the baby, her fetus had some kind of like rare disease. So she was studying spiders to try to find a cure. So her daughter wouldn't have this disease. But the reveal of this is like Dakota's watching this vision play out of her mom at the doctor talking like she's in the room. And the first thing she says when she sees her mom is like, why do you hate me? Her mom can't hear it. It's a vision. And then she finds about the thing. And she goes, but I was never sick, which, like, which is weird. And then she goes, oh, you didn't hate me. You just wanted me to not be sick. And it worked. The spider venom saved me. I'm not sick. You did love me. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. That's how the scene sounds. Like Dakota Johnson's just like reading off a teleprompter. And I remember thinking like, that's such a weird way to characterize having like mommy issues because your mom died giving birth to you and you were raised in, by the foster care system was like, my mom must have hated me. That's why she got killed. <laughs> you know, it's not like, oh, why was I abandoned? Why was I left? I don't know the, the true parentage of my life. It's no, no, no. You know, your mom died giving birth to you. And you're like, what a bitch. <laughs> What a selfish bitch. Why did she just die? <laughs> like what? It's, it's absurd. Uh, but she ends up, you know, saving the girls and stuff. And like, here's what the movie, the, you know, the very end of it fully, fully like does, does this fork thing to me. It partially made me hate it more than ever and be so glad that it was going to be unsuccessful and there'd be no sequels. And then part of me also wished that there was a sequel because I know it could only be even worse. And that is that she saves the day. They beat Ezekiel. Peter is born. Ben is, is with his sister. Um, cause the father is like off somewhere. We don't know where Richard is and, and setting up the whole thing about Richard being a spy or whatever. And they go, the girls go to check on, uh, Cassie cause they, they have to save her life too. There's a, one of the sequences where they're at the motel hiding out is structured a little bit. Like when you're watching the Ninja Turtles movie and they're at that farmhouse kind of like an age of Ultron Avengers where they're just at a house in the middle of the movie. And it's like the kind of the, the kind of cool down period. It's like that. And she's trying to show the girls like how to fight back, but she doesn't know how to do anything, uh, combat related. Like none of them do. So she teaches them all how to do CPR. <laughs> she teaches them how to do like chest compressions. Cause like, Oh, this guy has venom. And if you get it, you you'll, you're going to need chest compressions to survive. That never happens, but she ends up like, uh, drowning in the water again and they have to give her chest compressions because she taught them so well how to give chest compressions and save her life. But she ends up in the hospital. They imply that she's blind because like Madame Webb is blind and they imply that she can't walk anymore. And while she's in there, she's trying to explain basically that like she unlocked her third eye kind of. There's a part, <sighs> the, the Spider-Man thing is with great power comes great responsibility, right? Like P Un Uncle Ben says that to Peter, it, it drives his whole life. When the Aranya's spirit guide person is teaching her about her powers, she's like, how am I going to fight this guy? He has all these powers and I, I, all I do is see him in the future. And he's like, no, like once you take on the responsibility, you will be given great power. And I was like, what the fuck does that even mean? So while she's trying to protect the girls, she, you know, fully takes on the responsibility of these girls. And then she develops a power where she can like be in more than one place at the same time, which I don't think is a power Madame Web ever had. And it's not even a power that seems to be to make sense. It's just her like projecting herself like shadow clone jitsu. It's really weird. So, but after that scene, it's implied that she's like the one now, like she sees and all she sees everything. She understands everything. She's like fully actualized or whatever. So while they're in the hospital bed and the girls are like, oh, hey, you know, and uh, the baby's fine. And Ben's in there and like, oh yeah, he's going to love being an uncle. All the fun, none of the responsibility. And then she just goes, <laughs> that's what he thinks. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. So if she can see into the future enough to know that her friend Ben is going to have to raise that baby, that means she knows something's going to happen to the baby's parents, Ben's sister and his brother-in-law. And I would assume she also knows that Ben himself is going to get fucking murdered. <laughs> so like, what is she chuckling about? She's just like, yeah, he, that's what he thinks he's going to have to do. It's like, wait, wait. So you just know, you already know that he's going to have to raise that baby and he's going to get killed. And you're just like, spoilers. Like, what are you fucking kidding me? So at that moment, I was just like, you, I, I was the only person no one bought a ticket to the four o'clock show. I was in there by myself in an auditorium. It's like 300 people. It's just me. And literally it was like, what the fuck? Like, are you serious right now? Like, we're really doing this. 
And then she ends up, I guess, it implies that she adopts the girls, and then it cuts to her apartment. Now she has, like, a motorized sci-fi chair, and she has these, like, shades on. And they're like, what about, how's your vision? And she's like, it's better than it's ever been before. That's the other thing. I can't do the voice properly, but Dakota Johnson sounds alternately annoyed and incredulous the whole movie. But once she has this, these visions and she puts the little shades on, she just starts talking like this. <laughs> like she's she's fully this character now. Like she's she's Madame Webb. And it's very weird. Uh, but she says, oh, I can see very clearly. And it's like, well, do you see us? And she's like, yes, I can. I see you guys. And it's, it's a little montage of them being superheroes for like 30 seconds and fighting crime and stuff. But in the montage, she's there too. And she has her own little suit on. And it looks like shit. And she's just stuck to a web posing behind them and stuff, even though it implies that she can't walk anymore. Um, very, very strange. Very, very bad. Very, very ugly. But the best part is she's like explaining all this stuff. And it's like, and we fight the, we fight the bad guys. We do good things. And then she goes, and that's the best thing about the future. It hasn't happened yet. And like, it's kind of looking at the camera like, yeah, sequel. Never going to be a sequel to this movie. Like that's never going to happen. That's, that's not going to happen ever. Like there's there's no way. But in this moment, I was so torn between like, oh, I'm so glad there's not going to be a sequel because this sucked to being like, man, but how much worse could, because the sequel, my feeling is the sequel might give me what I wanted the most out of this, which, which is for it to be so bad that it was fun. For it to be so bad that it was entertaining and so bad that it was funny. Um, The last few minutes of the movie gave me that vibe. But this could go in some really, really terrible, interesting ways. But it's never going to happen. I'm just stuck with this regular bad movie. Completely normal, not good movie. Total throwback to the pre-MCU era of superhero movies where the people making the movies would just take a handful of basic ideas from the comic and then do their own thing. That's fine. But the, the more and more they joked about Ben... Uncle Ben and the baby and Peter and all this different stuff. The more and more I was like, come on. Uh, especially because like they're not, they can't do anything with it. I will say one thing. I haven't said anything nice about the movie. One positive thing about the movie. Major kudos to Adam Scott for like treating Ben like it's a real character, like it's a real person. And being one of the only people in the movie who feels like a real person. Like, not easy job. He did, he did, he did, he did a nice little thing. He makes it as watchable as he can in his, in his scenes. But that's Madam Web. Don't even go see it for the lul- the lulls, or go don't go see it for the bit. It's not even worth doing that for real. Like it's I I thought I was gonna like have such a blast laughing at it, and I was gonna come here and joke around with you guys in the pod, and like oh we're all gonna laugh at how bad this movie is. No, it's just not good. <laughs> it's just bad. All right, we've got, <laughs> got time for a couple of questions. Um. I'm sorry. The movie was just, uh, all right. First question. Uh, my good friend Fatura asks, is there a good wrestling movie slash show slash whatever that's got the tone of like rounders? Also, what other human passion do you think would benefit greatly from getting its own rounders? Oh, that's kind of cool. Um, rounders is one of my favorite movies. I rewatched rounders recently and it holds up so well. It's such a good poker movie. It's such a good movie. Everything about it is really good. But um, there isn't really a movie about wrestling that's like that. All of the good things about wrestling that really show you how it how it functions as an industry are generally speaking like documentaries. Like Beyond the Mat is pretty good at showing you like a variety of things about about wrestling, especially because it shows you like a weird amount of access to '90s Attitude Era WWF um, that like was kind of unprecedented the, uh, unprecedented at the time. And uh, there's a handful of docs like that that show you. You know, this is kind of what's going on. Some of them are like not even like, even the ones that aren't good. I like wrestling so much. I just like watching people talk about it, Uh, especially if it's like people who aren't very successful just because it's all, you don't have to be hugely good at it for the fundamentals to be fascinating, you know? And uh, so, I mean, Iron Claw gets some stuff right. You know what I mean? It's pretty good. Uh, The Wrestler is pretty good at really capturing kind of like, the psychological side of it, like the, the, the turmoil of being a once big wrestler, having to struggle on the way down. Um, that's pretty good, but there hasn't really been, I don't think like one or even a couple like really great wrestling movies. I've always wanted to, to write one. I have, um, like two things of like kind of like half written over the years. And I don't know, maybe at some point I'll actually like do something with them, but 
Uh, one is like a really, really personal, like really deep, dear to me story. And then the other ones is like something, something a little more experimental, but I've, I, I love wrestling. And I think that it's still, there's still room for someone to make like a great movie about wrestling that will then become like the movie that you can put on. You know what I mean? Like, uh, in terms of like rounders, like there isn't anything about wrestling that's on rounders level. Like there's other stuff that's on, you know, maybe as good as the Mark Wahlberg gambler movie, <laughs> you know, like, you know, maybe not rounders level, maybe like that. Um, then I guess the wrestler would be kind of like the Mississippi grind. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, other, other, uh, human passions that would benefit from having rounders. <laughs> I've, I really want to see a rounders. It's just about magicians because <laughs> magic is one of my other favorite things. Uh, I, I, I think mag- magicians are really cool. Uh, but I also realize that that's kind of what the prestige is. But I mean, if there was like a more regular movie that wasn't, wasn't as fantastical as the prestige, but just showed what it's like being a magician and like what that, what that grind is like and stuff. I think that'd be really cool. There might be a movie like that already that I've just never seen, but I, I like to think that if it existed, I would have seen it already. I love magic. Um, that's a really good question. But yeah, I, I really do want there to be more movies about wrestling. There's so many great stories in wrestling and just without how it works and stuff that I think no one's ever really quite done, you know? And, um, yeah, it's, that's something I really want to see happen. Even if there's a strong chance, I just end up doing it myself somehow, uh, which could happen. You never know. Um, okay. One more question from Kyle. Hey Kyle. Question for the next episode. What are some genres, eras, countries, directors, etc., that you consider blind spots in your otherwise voracious consumption of film? And then on the flip side, what is a blind spot you believe exists for the general film enjoying audience, however you want to quantify that, good luck, <laughs> that you would encourage people to explore? Okay, good question. Uh, so first half of that question, um, blind spots. So I have a handful of things that like I, my thing is like to other people that don't know a lot about movies, they think that I know a lot about movies, like a lot, a lot. But to me, someone who knows a lot of other people who know a lot about movies, I always think that I have like just enough knowledge to get by. It's how I feel about myself. So like there's tons of, like I have a lot of big blind spots. Like I've never gotten that into Kubrick. Um, there's a bunch of Kubrick movies I've never seen. Uh, I've, I've never gotten, into just a variety of filmmakers who are like filmmakers that people are that are very beloved but i've just never ever really like dug into that deeply um in terms of like country type stuff i mean like i've i like some japanese film but there's like a lot of a lot of like japanese filmmakers i'm not as familiar with um i've seen a fair amount of like spanish film but i could definitely stand to see more foreign film in general like i I like watching international cinema but i'm there's a lot of a lot of blind spots for me there largely just because i tend to gravitate towards stuff that like already very broadly influence something i already like like that's usually how i kind of function right like you know um if i see something i really dig it and then i find out this person was influenced by something else i'll go check those things out and i kind of branch out that way and as a result, there's all sorts of breakages where like there's tons of great and interesting films that did not influence the exact type of movies that I like. So then I, I end up not taking a chance on them quite as much as I should. So that's something I've for the longest time. One of my biggest blind spots was like documentaries. There's so many great classic documentaries and things. I just never fucking watched. You know what I mean? Um, especially stuff that's a little also specifically stuff that's like not just documentary, but anything that's like avant-garde or like different like i'm very much like a narrative movie guy i'm very much like i care about like the writing of it and stuff so things that are a little bit more abstract or things that are a little bit more artsy and like strange and not as quantifiable i want to 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 explore more of that stuff and i typically just don't and i need to kind of fix that um it's just not <laughs> i remember a couple of years ago on this channel or a few years ago now um shit four years ago now oh my god four years ago um, I watched like every David Lynch movie cause I'd only seen a couple, you know what I mean? Like that was a big thing for me. I just never got into Lynch. Um, so there's lots of stuff like that where it's like, I know I need to see and do more. And for a while lately, I've only been seeing like new things, uh, that I review and then like comfort old stuff or re rewatching a lot of stuff. Um, I think the only genre in the last couple of years that I've really 
seen a lot of new things in has just been horror. Like I watch way more horror that I've never seen before than any other genre. So, um, but that just kind of comes from like feeling insecure about how many of my friends have really robust horror knowledge and how little I have. So that's kind of where that's come from. Maybe if I had other friends that were quietly shaming me about not having seen more of a certain era of French film or something like that, then I'd do that too. Maybe that's what I, I got to find more mean friends or more, more friends who, you know, uh, will roast me for not having seen enough things. I have too many nice friends. What a, what a jerk. Um, what's the flip side of that? What's a blind spot that you think exists for the general public? Okay. So like, I think that in general, more than ever, especially now, a lot of people just don't know about how many movies are good from before they were born. Like when I was younger, when I was in high school and I first really, really started getting into movies, I saw so many movies that were before I was born because I just knew, hey, I missed a lot of stuff. I got to catch up. And nowadays, I find that more and more people... And I mean, this is maybe just anecdotal. I don't know. Maybe it's because of the internet, but, and because they're not quite as prominently featured on most streaming platforms and stuff. But a lot of people talk about movies that are older as if like, why would I even bother? <laughs> like, no, no movies got better after that. And it's like, that's, I don't think that's necessarily, I'm not even one of those people who says that like all the older stuff is better than the newer stuff. But I do think that the recency bias of thinking that like, you don't need to watch anything from before 1998 is weird, you know? Cause like when I was coming up, I listened to lots of music from before I was born. I watched movies from before I was born. I watched reruns of television from before I was born. And I feel like nowadays, a lot of younger people in general don't do that at all. I realize it's kind of like a wide ranging answer, but I mean, I, I think that's, I think that's the biggest thing. It's just like so many people, I think so many people don't know if you don't watch a lot of older movies, they think there's maybe one or two old movies they've seen that they didn't like, and they think everything was like that. <laughs> and they don't know how many old movies there are that feel so ahead of their time and feel so modern, and many of whom are directly responsible for whatever thing they say they like that came later, you know? So one of my favorite things to do is when I watch an old movie or I find an old movie to watch and I'm watching it and I'm like, holy shit, is this really as old as it is? Because it feels so new and it feels so alive and it feels so vital. And, um, I love that feeling. And obviously sometimes I put on an old movie and I'm like, this is boring. <laughs> sometimes I put on an old movie and I'm like, oh my God, like certain movies from the era where, um, you know, movies didn't fully feel like, you know, when movies became very much just like filmed plays and stuff, some of those movies can be kind of boring or whatever, but a lot of those are even amazing. I, I, there's something on TV on TCM, um, a week or so ago, like my mom came over and we were, we were watching something in the background and we're looking up and just being marveling at the blocking of the scene. I don't remember what movie it was, um, but there was just uh, the way the, the the way the actors were arranged, the way the camera moved and stuff. And it wasn't like crazy over the top stuff, but it was just a type of blocking that I realized like no one does anymore. And I was like, man, this isn't even like some crazy classic. Everyone has to see a movie. This is just how movies used to be. And uh, I think more people should just be open to checking that stuff out. You know. Um, I feel the way about everything though. You know what I mean? Like there's the people who like don't know any music from before a few years ago. And I just think that's crazy. Or when they discover something, they're always like really their minds blown. Um, so yeah, I think people need to do that with movies. Also, uh, well, one other blind spot for myself is I, I'm always trying to, to force myself a little bit out of my dude's rock comfort zone. Um, like I always, I, I'm always telling myself like I need to just remind myself more that if I have a night and I can watch a movie and I have a choice between a movie with like James Conn in it or some guy with a gun or some kind of car chase, or maybe there's a quietly meditative rumination on the matter of meaning of true love or something, you know, from like, uh, some, some European filmmaker I've ever seen before. Maybe I should just watch that and I don't have to only watch that stuff, but I just need to force myself to get out of my comfort zone more often. Um, I think it's just important. I think, I think watching, stuff that you don't always instantly gravitate towards is good. Like, I don't think you have to always be giving yourself homework. I don't think everything has to be some kind of chore. Like you should want to watch stuff obviously, but, uh, I do always feel like, man, um, my friend Izzy, uh, you guys know Izzy. She runs uh, the be kind of Rewind YouTube channel. 
She makes great content. Amazing, amazing content. Really good video essays. She's, she's great. Love Izzy. Um, I can't count how many times I'll be watching one of Izzy's videos and she'll just be like referencing a film where I'm like, I've never seen that. I should just go watch that. And then I'll go watch list it. And then when I have a night where I can watch it, instead, I'm just like, I'm going to rewatch the outfit. <laughs> I'm going to rewatch this movie with Robert Duvall and they're shooting people. You know what I mean? Like, there's just, I don't know what it is. That's like my comfort zone. And it's a little bit embarrassing. And, and I, I, I kind of hate how much I am the like fucking stereotypical male letterboxed user who's obsessed with Michael Mann and like, likes neon lit crime fiction. Like all that. I'm, I'm such a fucking stereotype, you know? Uh, but I like stuff that's different. I like other stuff too, you know, but I find that, um, at least in recent memory, I don't, I don't challenge myself enough to watch stuff like that. Um, and for a while I was reviewing movies at a, at a more consistent rate. Like I was writing at more publications and I would end up watching way more stuff that I didn't want to watch and regularly watching things you don't want to fucking watch is good for you. Uh, I think as a critic, as like a reviewer, as an analyst, cause it makes you think about things differently. And like, I feel like in the last year I watched a lot of just like whatever the new superhero thing is, whatever the big budget this is, whatever that. And, um, I don't know. I feel smaller somehow. So hopefully this year I'll actually roll the dice more often. And I think uh, I encourage other people to roll the dice more often too. Thank you guys for the questions. I think that does it for us this week. Uh, it's like the second or third episode in a row that hits the 90 minute mark. If you've made it this far and you guys want the show to be 20 minutes shorter, just tell me. I think I think I, need, I might need to start tightening up a little bit here. I'm so afraid one week I'm going to wake up and we have a two hour episode and it's like by myself, me, two two full hours. I have to I have to maybe have a hard rule that the, no episode can be longer than Men in Black. <laughs> and I think I've already broken that rule. So, <laughs> um, that's it. That's the that's the episode. Thank you guys for listening and or watching. If you watch this on YouTube uh, and you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. If you loved it, please subscribe. Hit the little bell icon thing so you get notifications whenever I put out new videos and if you're listening to this just uh on whatever podcast platform you know please share please follow me if you can on there leave a review or something that type of thing if you have any questions or comments you can comment below on the youtube version or you can just hit me up you can email me at armchairautor at gmail.com and any questions that you want like answered on the episode just say like this is for the episode um and yeah i, I always love having questions from you guys uh, I feel like I'm kind of due for an episode that's like more question heavy than the last ones have been. So please feel free to just bombard me with shit. I don't care what, if you think it's a dumb question or something. I like the engagement, the interaction part of this. So thank you guys all again for listening and supporting. I hope everyone's doing well. We will talk soon.